I'm pleased to announce that I'm going to be doing a new course called The Genius of Matthew, what scholars say about the first gospel. The course will be made up of eight lectures on February 3rd and 4th, so four lectures each day, and each day will end with a Q&A session. If you attend these lectures, you'll get the recording with some extra materials, such as bibliography and questions for further reflection, that you can keep for lifetime use. I'm very interested in this topic. <laughs> the Gospel of Matthew is one of the most popular books of the entire Bible and has been for a very long time. It is, in fact, today, the most frequently read book of the entire New Testament. And there's good reason. Matthew has some amazing material in it that's not found anywhere else. The Sermon on the Mount is found only in Matthew. And the Sermon on the Mount contains some of the most familiar teachings of Jesus that people have relished for centuries. The Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. The Antitheses, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who's in heaven. The Golden Rule, do unto others. These passages and many others are really well known among Bible readers, but Matthew is widely misunderstood, and frankly, it's often underappreciated. Many people don't recognize the real genius that goes into this work, and in this course, I'm going to be trying to explain it, based on what scholars have learned by decades and decades of modern study. Scholars have found things about this gospel that most people would not expect. We'll be dealing with some key questions in this course. For example, Matthew is widely thought to have used the Gospel of Mark as a source for many of its accounts. But why does Matthew change Mark so often? Didn't he like it the way it was? He adds a lot of material, he takes away some stories, and he alters things. Does he ever change things in ways that make his account contradictory to Mark's account? Why does Matthew include a genealogy of Jesus? a genealogical line into which Jesus himself is not born <laughs> because he's born of a virgin. Matthew frequently quotes the Old Testament to show that Jesus was the Messiah, but does he take these passages out of context and does he misunderstand them? Or is he simply following established procedures of Jewish interpretation? Jesus sure has some strict teachings in the Gospel of Matthew. He says the law of Moses indicates you should not kill anyone, but Jesus says, don't even get angry. The law says, don't commit adultery. Jesus says, don't even lust after somebody. Can he be serious? When Jesus does give his law, his law, in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere in Matthew, is he rejecting Moses? Is he saying that the law of Moses isn't good enough, that his followers don't have to keep the law? If so, why in some passages, does Jesus tell his followers that they have to keep the law of Moses even better than the scribes and the Pharisees? What? Jesus' followers have to keep the Jewish law? Matthew's gospel is often called the most Jewish gospel of the New Testament. At the same time, many people point out that it's virulently anti-Jewish. Well, how can it be both? These are some of the many questions we'll be dealing with in the course. We'll be looking at who the author was, how this book got into the New Testament, and how scribes later changed it. Is it possible, for example, that the entire birth narrative, chapters one and two, were a later addition? I've talked about some of these topics before, but never at the depth I'm going to be doing here, and most of the issues we'll be addressing in this course I've never lectured on publicly. The course again will be on February 3rd and 4th, eight lectures. The cost for coming will be $59.95. Those who come to these lectures will get the course for lifetime use. We do have an early bird discount. If you register for the course by January 28th, you'll be able to buy it for $49.95. I hope you do so. I'm looking forward to seeing you there.